1665, there was an outbreak of plague in London. Cambridge University closed down as a precaution, and one young scientist left Cambridge for the safety of his home here at Wolfthorpe Manor. His name was Isaac Newton, and he would go on to become the most famous scientist in the world. During the two years that Newton spent at Wolfthorpe, he discovered the law of gravity and the laws of motion. He made important discoveries about light, and he became one of the inventors of the calculus. He went on to become president of the British Royal Society, one of the first national scientific associations in the world. Newton had been born in 1642, the year that Galileo died. In the years after Galileo, scientists like Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle and the founders of the Royal Society didn't see any conflict between their faith and their scientific inquiries. In fact, Boyle spent a lot of time thinking and writing about the relationship between science and faith, and Newton was more interested in his theological investigations than in his physics. Now, we often think of the period of about 1680 to about 1800 as the Enlightenment. We often get the story here that, you know, finally, yes, the church had been shaken by Galileo and by Copernicus and all of these people, but it got its grip tightly back again. But then the Enlightenment came in and all was peace and light and love and joy. No, it actually wasn't as simple as that. This is a myth. It's a myth created in the 19th century. People living in 1750 didn't know they were living in the Enlightenment. On the other hand, though, yes, there were great discoveries. Newton's laws of gravitation were seen as a new way of understanding the cosmos. People like John Hunter in England, Scotsman working in England, does fundamental work understanding of the human body and anatomy and asks one of the first key questions about what is infection and what actually causes people to die from things that they pick up. Likewise, too, you have the realisation that matter is not made of the old four elements, earth, air, fire and water, but of discrete substances, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, silicon and so on. All these are at that time. Robert Boyle took an interesting approach to all kinds of issues bearing on faith. From the time he was a young man, from the time he was no more than 20 years old, his approach was best summed up in the following phrase. He whose faith never doubted may justly doubt of his faith. Every time he ran into a question that seemed to have some bearing on whether or not it made sense to believe in God or to believe in the Christi in Christian religion, he thought deeply about it and explored the avenues suggested by the question and came to a conclusion in his mind where he could see how to put together diverse perspectives on aspects of nature and on aspects of God. He did this his whole life. He spent a lot of time in his life writing works about theology in a, in a serious way and writing books relating theological ideas to scientific ideas. It's not too much to say, in fact, that it was perhaps the most important enterprise of his life in his own mind. So how did Boyle see the relationship between science and faith? He held them in relation to each other. I wouldn't say it was always necessarily a picture of harmony. Sometimes the ideas were quite different from one another, and he simply saw them as ideas that made sense in a single picture, but didn't necessarily harmonize in a close way. For example, he spoke about truths above reason in one of his books. These are truths that we cannot get from nature such as the triune nature of God, truths that we could learn elsewhere from revelation or from reason rather than from, rather than from nature. And these truths did not conflict with truths from science, but they did not harmonize with them either. They were of a different order. So there were some truths that one could hold without a, a basis in science, and they were still true. They didn't conflict with science, but they didn't derive from it but they could be held together in a perfectly reasonable way. Now, that was Boyle's approach to some things. Other things, he thought science actually directly aided faith, especially 
in terms of the argument from design. Boyle was convinced that the strongest argument you could find for the being of a deity, as he puts it, were arguments from the complexity of nature. Biological nature above all, but also the physical universe. That from evidence of design in nature, one could infer a god. And his goal in doing this was moral. Boyle wanted people to be moved, personally moved by the conviction that God exists. As he puts it, he wants them to be affectively convinced of it. And so this will result in pious living and true worship. The first modern scientists like Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle would have been very surprised by the claim that there's a conflict between science and faith. One legendary example of this conflict is the debate over evolution between Thomas Huxley and Samuel Wilberforce that happened in Oxford in 1860. Next time, we'll examine what really happened in this great debate. <laughs>